Dr. Brian Powell, the Kentucky District Superintendent, is with us this week, and he's going to share a message titled, Holy, Holy, Holy. I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastorman Podcast. He's coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We celebrate His Lordship this morning. It certainly is great to be with you. I'm excited uh, about your pastor and his wife being here. I've never had a pastor come to the district at such a strange time. It's been a very strange season. And uh, as I hear talks of, of vaccines or, or whatever, I'm just hopeful uh, that we're at the tail end of this coronavirus thing and that 2021 is going to be a year of great hope. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful for that. You know, I believe personally that we live in an age where people tend to, uh, to idolize good things and trivialize great things. And, and I want to explain what I mean by that. I mean, I, I think I could use a whole lot of examples to sort of drive this point home. But uh, I could talk about hobbies, which we all had or have. I could talk about relationships with other people. I could talk about uh, media, social media, just a variety of things. But I think I'm going to use a sports analogy because sports seem to run deep. Especially here in Kentucky. Now, I, I've lived in a few large cities in my life. I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for a number of years, pastored there. And I've now lived in the Louisville Metro for, this is our, ending our sixth year here. And um, I've also lived in some medium-sized cities throughout my life. Um, I grew up in High Point, North Carolina, pastored in Decatur, Illinois. Those were both cities at the time were probably around 80 to 100,000 or so. I've, I've lived in small towns like Greensburg. I've lived in Yatkinville, North Carolina, where I pastored my first church. My point is that regardless of the size of the town that I've lived in, everywhere I've lived, they've all had one thing in common. They love their team. They, they love their sports. I mean, how many UK fans we got here? A whole bunch. No Cardinal fans. At least you're not brave. Oh, one in the back. They got you in the back, don't they? Back right there against the wall at the cubby. That's what y'all do the Cardinal fans here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've squeezed into a stadium filled with people. Whether at a high school game, watching my son, or Heinz Field, Heather and I love to go watch the Pittsburgh Steelers play. Um, it doesn't matter, though, how many times have I gone in, I can't count, to stadiums packed with people. And man, when our team scores, it's nothing for me to turn around to people I don't even know and start high-fiving. That's good. That's fun, isn't it? You've never been bear hugged by a man the size of a grizzly bear wearing face paint? <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. It's fun. It, it's, it's good. That's all good. I mean, I have a, my basement is is devoted. It's the man cave. I mean, it's a Pittsburgh Steeler haven. You know, those are good things. It, it's good, clean fun. And when I think about the, the, the grandness of, of these events, our festivals, concerts, you know, Louisville is a very festive place. And when I think about the festivities of the city and things like that and people gathering in these large groups and, man, if you ever gathered in a sports stadium and they start singing the team's anthem, the fans know it by heart. I mean, it's burned into their soul. Kind of reminds me of worship. If I'm being honest, I mean, these big stadiums are like temples, and 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 the anthems that we sing when we're there, when we celebrate, it's like praise, and the teams are like God. Now, don't get me wrong; 
You can't leave here and say, oh, the preacher said sports are bad. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I said they're good. Everybody understand they're good. Whatever it is you like, it's not that it's bad. It's good. It's just that there's something greater. There's something greater that deserves our attention. I don't want to be guilty of idolizing the good while neglecting the great. While neglecting the greatest gift mankind's ever been given. While neglecting the walk that I've been called to walk. And the life that I don't ever want to be found guilty of giving more energy and time and effort to the good things. While neglecting the greatest. Would you turn to Isaiah chapter 6 with me as we read a very familiar passage today. I would like you to try to hear it like you've never heard it before. If you would, turn to Isaiah 6 and let's stand together as we read through the word of the Lord. Isaiah 6, I believe this will also be on the screen starting in verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, the prophet says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Verse 2, seraphim, or angelic beings, angels, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. With one he called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy. That's what they said about the child laying in a manger. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Everybody say that with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Now look at the, listen to the prophet's response. You've heard it, but really, really hear it. Then Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm undone. In other words, I'm not sure how to respond to this. Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. And we all say praise the Lord to that. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it Never return to Lord. God, I humble myself at the foot of the cross this morning. Lord, may Jesus be lifted up. Oh God, we've celebrated Jesus this morning already. And I thank you for the joy that truly does exist here in the midst of this congregation right now. Even in the midst of hard times, God, that's what faith is about. Allowing you to touch our hearts in deep ways that change our perspective. And so, God, I pray that you'd be with us this morning and you'd give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. In Christ's name, together we say, Amen. If I were to give you a sermon in a sentence or a main idea for what I want to talk to you about this morning is simply this. The only thing that makes us worthy is our willingness to to admit that we're not worthy. We're not worthy. Woe is me. Nothing in me makes me intrinsically deserving of the grace of God. The grace of God that was manifest in a manger the grace of God that's manifest all over this sanctuary right now in these colors in this festive season and this festive time of year. I'm not deserving of God's grace. 
not to experience it in this life, nor uh, much less experience eternal life. I'm certainly undeserving of that. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are beyond my ability to comprehend them. And I'm okay with that. But I have come to understand something in my faith, and that is, if I don't get some things right about this God we serve, if there's some foundational things that I get out of place, I'm going to have an improper view of who God is and an inflated view of who I am. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as I point a couple of things out to you from Isaiah this morning. And the first thing I want to point out is this. God is sovereign. I mean, God is sovereign over all, in all, and through all. God is the chief authority of the entire universe. No one usurps his power. God, he, he says, I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me in Isaiah 46. Friends, we have an incomprehensibly great God. He is without error. Do you understand that? Absolute perfection. Friends, he is without equal. There is no one like him in the entire universe. Of the 100 billion stars in our solar system, God knows them all by name. Of the 350 quintillion gallons of water that cover the oceans of this earth, God knows every microorganism in every drop. That's how big God is. Of the 100,000 follicles on the human scalp, God knows the precise number of hairs on your head. And for some of us, that's easier than others. <laughs> Friends, there's not one inch of creation. There's not one grain of sand. There's not a drop of water. There's not a leaf that falls off of a tree in autumn. There's not a snowflake that falls to the ground in the winter. There's not a cloud in the sky. There's not a speck of dirt on the face of the earth. There's not a wind gust that blows through your backyard that God doesn't know and that does not respond to the behest of King Jesus. God is sovereign. And if we don't get that right, we're not going to get anything else right. He's in charge. It's his plan. It's up to him. It's what he wants to do. And the only way you can ever live into that life is by faith. That's the only way you can ever live into that is by faith. Now, throughout history, we know leaders have come and gone, don't we? I mean, we, we know kings have come and gone. Presidents have come and gone. But one king, he remains. And, and the Bible says he rules them all. I mean, we're accustomed to presidents being in office for four years, and if they're lucky, eight years. I, I mean, this political system is just rough in our country. King Uzziah, I bring that up to say this. King Uzziah had reigned over these people for 52 years. How many of you know 52 years is a long time? Since the last time I saw you, I've become a papa. It's one of the greatest things I've ever experienced in my life. Yes. I can't describe it. And we're, me and him are already getting in all kinds of trouble together with his parents. It amazes me how the table split. My, my point in telling you that I'm a grandfather now is not uh, simply to share that news, but it's to tell you I'm not 52 years old yet. 52 is a long time. 52 years is a long time. Uzziah reigned as king for 52 years and then suddenly he was dead. How do you think the people felt? I'm sorry. Scared? Oh, he's been really good to us. We've prospered under him. Wonder who's going to be next. Their hearts were filled with anxiety. There was a void. And here comes the prophet, the man of God, and he is declaring a message, and here's what he is saying. 
Friends, I've actually gotten a glimpse of the one true king, and he hadn't gone anywhere. He's still in charge. He's still reigning. I beheld his glory, and it was unspeakably boundless. The prophet said, listen, people, this king that oversees us is a king like no other. Hallelujah. Around the throne, Isaiah described angelic beings that were literally ablaze. They're ablaze on fire with adoration for this king. We don't know exactly how many, but John in the book of Revelation tells us that there are thousands upon thousands and ten thousands and ten thousands of heavenly hosts gathered around the throne of God continually singing praises to the king. I want you to consider that at this very moment on the fourth Sunday of Advent in 2020 in the United States of America, at this moment the angels in heaven are gathered around the throne of God and they're singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when we get done today and go home and take our Nazarene nap, they'll still be singing. And when we celebrate Christmas with our families this coming week, wherever that may be, they'll still be singing. And when we get into 2021 and in the next few months and in the next few years, they'll still be singing. Holy, holy, holy. It's interesting to me. That's the one word that just can't reappear. That's the one word that kept coming off their lips. Holy. Holy. God is sovereign. Amen, friends. He's never had a wrong thought. He's never had a, a skewed motive. He never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. God does always does what is right. Even things that we don't understand. Things that have the tendency to cause us grief or to cause us pain or to cause us harm. God is always working all things together for good. To those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Amen. May it never be said. In our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you walk with Jesus? Amen. You love it. May it never be said in our walk with Jesus Christ. May it never be said in all that we do that there's not obvious respect for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We understand that God's place is way up here and our place is way down here. Thank God Jesus filled that gap. But he's the king and we're not. And if we're not careful, we'll start elevating ourselves and he'll start, his position in our lives will just, uh, by, by default, as we elevate, begin to look, become lower in our minds. And what we find ourselves doing is, is getting closer to the same uh, walking path or the same level, if you will, with the Lord. And without a remembrance and, a, and an understanding and an honor being paid to the sovereignty and the rulership and the kingship of God, it's easy for our thinking to get mixed up. So that's how I want to approach him first, as the king. Now, he's more than that. But I want to approach him as the king. How do you respond to a king? How do you respond to such a king as this? In my opinion, humility. I believe that's the Bible's advice. Humility is the only appropriate posture. Isaiah, a righteous man, he's the preacher, he's the prophet. Look at his response. Woe is me, for I am ruined. He wasn't saying that he was off running from God or living far away from God. He was just saying all of his, he, he went on the right. My very best is like filthy rags in comparison to who he is. Same, same author. It wasn't that he was bad. It's just that he realized that the very best he could conjure up didn't even compare. That blows my mind. I don't think we often consider the full effects of sin in our society. Sin really will take people further than they anticipate going. And sin really will cost people a whole lot more 
than they ever thought they'd have to pay. Any stories throughout the Bible, I believe they're there. And that while the primary purpose of every story is glory to God, to bring glory to God, I believe they're all there to teach us valuable lessons. And one of the primary lessons, especially in the narratives of the Old Testament, is to point out the problem of sin. To point out what a deep problem, what a deep impact sin has had on the human race. I think of stories like Sodom and Gomorrah. And in light of our uh, politically correct culture, I mean, there are many today that just can't envision how God could actually take the lives, regardless of what they were doing, how he could rain down fire and brimstone. Yet that's what the Bible says happened. And I, I think the reason we don't get stuff like that, or, or maybe you do, but because our society as a whole is becoming more and more detached from stuff like that, that way of thinking, is because they don't understand the depths of depravity and sin, the very thing God is trying to warn us about in the Old Testament and the New. Sin leads to death. God is trying to illustrate that. And he's given us life. Through his son Jesus who came in a manger, lived his life, and died on the cross. And I don't know about you, but humility is the only posture I can think of when it comes to a Savior like that. Friends, I, I think in order to truly understand the harsh reality of sin, is not necessarily to think about the sins being committed. You see, committed acts of sin is actually the fruit of a deeper reality. We act because we are. We act on notions that get implanted in our minds and in our hearts. So when we speak of sin and God's remedy for sin, we're not just speaking of God's remedy for the sins that you might have committed in your life or that you may commit in your life. No, we're speaking to the fact that you're a sinner. Outside of the grace of God, I'm a sinner. Without a chance. But he loves me anyway. Oh man, that's good news, friends. He loves me anyway. Friends, we need to understand. We need to understand. We, we need to stop focusing so much on the little sins that being committed because there's a deeper reality. Until the deeper reality is handled, the sins are going to keep being committed. Friends, we need to start thinking about the one we're sinning against. Holy. When we understand how, how perverse human depravity really is, then we'll understand why the gospel is so important. We'll understand then why, why the gospel is the good news. Friends, we deserve death and God gives us life. Uh, and we expect the right thing to be rewarded and we expect the wrong thing to be punished, right? In our society, that's what we expect. The right thing to be rewarded and the criminals and the wrong thing to be punished. But friends, that's intuitively how we expect God to think, I believe sometimes. But the gospel is just the opposite of that. It's counterintuitive to our natural way of thinking. In Christ, you get what you don't deserve, and you don't get what you do deserve. Friends, that's backwards. There's not a court in this land that would rule that way. But I'm glad we've got a more powerful attorney than any in this universe. We've got a more powerful substitute. Somebody standing in the gap for us, friends. And, and people, we, we say, man, that seems like a scandal. 
How can God do that? Isaiah 53 tells us. He was crushed for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The penalty of sin is harsh. He was wounded, bruised, striped. He endured the punishment of sin in the place of sinners. Did you hear that? He didn't, I didn't just die for sin. I took the place of sinners. Praise his name. Yes. If you've been saved by this Jesus, man, you ought to, have a, you ought to be shot the roof off. That's what he's done for us. And I don't know about you, but once again, humility is the only posture I can think of as a way of approaching him. How can God show wrath towards sinners and yet love sinners at the same time? That's a compelling question. I know the answer, and you do too. It's right there. That's how he does it. You see it? And that's a beautiful cross. And, and I know why it's hanging on the wall. But I gotta tell you, the cross that God used to do it was nowhere near as beautiful as that. It, it was a bloody cross. It, it was a beat up cross. It was a place where criminals were executed. And that's how the cross, friends, is God's it, full expression. It's the full expression of God's holy wrath upon sin and God's holy love for sinners coming together in one glorious moment. The greatest gift the world's ever been given. God's sovereign over all. Amen? Humility is our only response. If we want to walk in a right relationship with Jesus, humility is the only response. I got one more thing for you, though. God is with us, and there's always more. Man, and that's the way you don't have to climb up and bridge the gap between you and God because God wants to come down. In fact, He already has in Jesus. He's already come down in Jesus, but guess what? The Holy Spirit just keeps coming, He just keeps coming. And he's with us. You know, it's interesting to me. Sometimes we gather for church services and we invite the Holy Spirit with the invocation, right? We, we invite the Holy Spirit to come. Right? Is your heart open to that? Come, Holy Spirit. Don't be scared of that. Some people are scared to death of that. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he starts messing up your hair. He messes up your composure. That's okay. That's biblical. It's okay. But, but when we start talking about that and, 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 and with some, they, they begin to question that sort of uh, conversation or that sort of teaching, this idea that the Holy Spirit falls in a new way or moves. And so the question then becomes, well, why would we invite God to come if we in fact believe he's already here? I believe that's a fair question. And the only way to understand the depths of God's presence is to understand that he makes himself known in measures. And we're living like this. When we understand who he is and who we are, guess what? Those visitation moments become often. And, and so, in other words, God is with us, but there's always more. There's always more of God to experience. The prophet Isaiah said this in, in uh, verse 1. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Now that word filling implies that his robe filled the temple, but then continued to fill the temple. He also talks about the smoke, the the essence of God's holiness and presence filling the temple, but yet it continued to fill the temple. 
You, you see where I'm going with that? I want you to imagine God sitting on a throne up here and he's lofty and exalted and we're part of the angelic crowd and we're gathered around and the veil's been pulled back and we're able to see, to get a glimpse. And while you're watching, you're seeing the essence that God's, God's robe, the, the smoke, the presence of who he is filling up all the space, but yet it just keeps coming. It's like at some point you would think there would be an end to it or everything would be full. But it's not. He's eternal. He just keeps working. He just keeps moving. So whatever prayer you're praying, don't give up. Don't give up on that child. Don't give up on that job. Don't give up on that relationship. Don't give up on that work situation. Don't give up on that dream. Don't give up on that life. Don't give up. Whatever it is, God's still working. There's always more. When I speak about the measures of God's presence, I would, I would have, first thing I would have to say is that God is everywhere. He is omnipresent. I mean, I, I think about, he, he, is, he is what occupies in everything and holds all things together, Colossians 1. He's everywhere all the time. He's the glue that holds creation together. Amen. Amen. I mean, he, he even showed, he, everybody breathing is being shown grace by the presence of God. Because there wouldn't be breath if his grace wasn't sufficient. But beyond that, there are deeper measures. One of them is this. God's presence is personal. God's presence is not just everywhere. His presence is also personal. God spoke to me in a profound way as I drove to Greensburg this morning in my car. I can't tell you how many times, I can't tell you, I can't recall how many times that I've traveled up and down the roads of this state where the Lord showed up in the car with me and overwhelmed me in such a way that I literally had to pull over. I couldn't keep driving. I love that fellowship with God. I can't, my, my favorite place in the world is, is a recliner in the room above my garage just talking to Jesus. His presence is personal. God's presence, another way, that it, uh, another way that it can be measured, another measure of God's presence, not just that it's common and everywhere but, and that it's personal, but also His presence is with the church where two or three are gathered. God shows up when our hearts are unified as his people and we're living on mission, when we're abiding by the great commission which he's called us to live by. Friends, God does some amazing things. God's presence can also be invoked. We've talked about that already. God's presence also is mysterious. That's another level of God's presence. In other words, sometimes you ever been in a situation with people where God just sort of showed up and you really couldn't make sense of it? First Kings 8, when the temple of Solomon was being dedicated, the priests could not perform their duties because they were completely astonished at the measure of God's presence. So friends, God is sovereign. Amen. Overall, in all, and through all. Humility. As we go into 2021, I would invite you to practice humility before this sovereign king and wage you Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. If, those, if you get those two things right, the result is always this. God's with you. And there's always more. And you know, even after all that, I stand most amazed at how this sovereign king of the universe is always provoking the heart of men and men everywhere. He's a king like no other. He is a king that leaves his throne and dwells in the lowliest of places. Your house, my house, the back alleys, the sidewalks, the drug houses. He invades that space. The only thing that makes us worthy is our 
willingness to admit wrong. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for this season of Advent. We celebrate the hope of Jesus right here this morning. God, we thank you for the gift you give us through your grace. Lord, may we, uh, may we learn to live woe is me lives in joy. Never be caught up in thinking that our ways are the better ways or that we know. But God, may we always remember that you are the one that holds all things together. Because God, as you work in ways that only you can in, these, in this service this morning, in this church, we anticipate 2021 and we thank you, God, that better days are on the horizon. We give you honor and glory, Lord for who you are and what you do in Christ's name. And together we say, amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast. If you live in or near the Greensburg, Kentucky area or find yourself visiting our community on a Sunday morning, please join us at 1030 a.m. Central Time at Greensburg Church of Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane.